time. Um, it's, uh, I'm Nick Stern. I'm chair of the uh, Grantham Institute and the Center for Climate Change, Economics and Policy here at the LSE. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome you. We're sort of looking back, digesting, thinking about um, what happened in Marrakesh, but in the context of uh, a rather eventful last uh, year or so, including, of course, uh, the Paris Agreement uh, about 8.30 p.m. on December the 12th uh, last year. So uh, they've asked me to uh, kick it off. Um, I don't want to steal the thunder of the people already on the panel, so I'll, I'll give a fairly impressionistic view of the way in which I've seen the last year or so, and particularly the last uh, week uh, week or so. Um, and then I'll hand over to um, those on the uh, agenda. I'll follow the order here. We'll start with Pete if Pete is here, and we won't start with Pete if Pete is not here. And then move up to Jennifer uh, Morgan, Emmanuel Guerin, and uh, Alina Avachenkova, and uh, all of whom played uh, major roles in the story of the last year or so. And here is Pete. So uh, welcome, Pete. We, we just, I've just sort of been clearing my throat, so you're, uh, you're very and welcoming everybody. So let me start with an impressionistic view of um, this last year and particularly this last week in uh, Marrakesh in, in the context of this last year or so. I think the first thing is to start with uh, recognition that 2015 was quite remarkable. Um, we had in Addis in July uh, a really serious discussion about financing for development where we put together, I think in a thoughtful, constructive way, a picture of um, development finance, particularly finance of the sustainable development goals with government revenue, private sector finance, international finance. All, all coming together. And I think facing it in a, a more integrated way than I've seen, really, in all the time I've been spending in international institutions. Um, in September, we agreed the Sustainable Development Goals, all without much uh, fuss, uh, with enthusiasm in the end, not terribly contentious, covering really the key issues in a strong and clear way and uh, very importantly applying to everybody, not just developing countries, um, as was the case with the um, Millennium Development Goals. <coughs> and obviously, if you're talking about sustainable development goals, you have to include everybody, because central to all this is the global commons, and the global commons is exactly that. It's a global commons that involves everybody. And there are duties around issues of equality and gender, which are universal, which apply, and, and others, which apply to rich countries as much as poor. So the Sustainable Development Goals were September, and of course the Paris Agreement in December. And if you put those two big agreements together, the Sustainable Development Goals and Paris, it is the first global agenda uh, since the years after the Second World War, when we had uh, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, the Bretton Woods institutions, the beginning of the European community and so on. I think there's, you have to go back that far to find anything that looks like a global agenda that applies to everybody. That's quite remarkable uh, in a difficult world to get that coming together. And remember in Paris and for the SDGs, but in Paris we had, yeah, I always, I'm confused as whether it's 195, 6 or 7. What number do you use, Pete? For the 195. 5. Let's call it 195. The, um, you uh, had 195 countries coming together without any dominant country, looking ahead and anticipating a big problem. Compare that with the Bretton Woods. 44 countries, one dominant country. The United States really could tell people what to do at uh, that time. Only 44 countries, and you had 30 years of two world wars and the Great Depression, blood in the carpets, blood in the fields, blood everywhere. Looking back in for the 30, preceding 30 years in 1944-5, you had to believe that cooperation made a lot of sense. 
and it would do much better than fighting each other. Paris, very different. 195, looking forward, no one dominant country. It was remarkable, absolutely remarkable that we, uh, we got that uh, agreement. So the first point I wanted to make was this global agenda is something special, something unique. It's something to uh, celebrate and uh, something that is critical to look after and nurture and build on and, it, of course, deliver on. The second, um, and of course underlined during events in this year, with it coming into force so rapidly with the um, ratification at the key hurdle levels in by early October, uh, it, India quite poetically on Gandhi's birthday, but uh, the EU essentially around the same time with the United States and China at the Hangzhou G20 uh, meeting in September. So it all came together very rapidly to pass the, the twin hurdles uh, for uh, coming into force, and it came into force on November the 4th. On November the 8th, there were the elections in the United States. So what do these mean? And of course, in June, there was Brexit. So lastly, others will be speaking much more about that. Um, at, I, I just note a few lines of optimism. I can do pessimism very well, and you can all do pessimism. So let me, without, without discarding the pessimism, let me also register one or two lines of optimism. Um, in no UK president, no sorry, <laughs> try that again. In no US uh, presidential election has climate really been a big issue, and the same was true of uh, this one. You know, if you look back to, uh, look at the re Republican candidates, because I suppose you'd expect to know where the de Democrat candidates were standing, but you know, if you look at um, John McCain and uh, George W. Bush, Mitt Romney, none of them chose to make climate change a big issue. Uh, and it wasn't. And it was true of this one too. Uh, it wasn't a big issue. There are a few quotes um, uh, from from Donald Trump, but not much. It wasn't a central issue. If you look what's come later, the delivery story looks to be around trade, uh, immigration, and infrastructure. Many of us have been arguing for a long time that... Uh, Infrastructure, particularly, particularly, of course, sustainable infrastructure, is an absolute key to growth in economies around the world. The IMF's been arg arguing it, Larry Summers, myself, many others. We're not un at all on our own in that story. And we assume, I think, uh, let's assume it anyway, that that infrastructure that will be built in, or in the, under the new administration um, will be steered in the direction of uh, modern, clean, and smart. I mean, why would you do outdated, dirty, and not so smart? So uh, that is a positive as well. And in the New York Times uh, discussions of two days ago, our friend Tom Friedman asked directly questions on climate change. And uh, Donald Trump replied that he has an open mind and that uh, essentially he recognises uh, a link between human activity and uh, global warming. So um, that's not quite the same as saying it's a conspiracy by the Chinese to put, uh, UK, uh, put US uh, industry out of business. So we don't know how the US will play through U.S. administration, the federal administration, will play through. We do know that the United States is made up of lots of things, um, states, cities, firms, and you see very strong, very strong movement on uh, uh, continue, continuing in you know, California and New York and uh, Walmart and Tesla, and you can run through the U.S. Uh, firms. So... We should not despair about where the United States is going. They're around 15% of world emissions. We hope they go down quickly rather than uh, slowly. 
Um, but we shouldn't despair. Nobody in their right mind is going to open a coal-fired power station in the United States <coughs> because you have to take a 20, 30, 40 year view and it wouldn't make sense in terms of where public policy and world policy is uh, likely uh, to go. So I strike some strands or identify some strands of optimism on, on the US. As I say, I can do the other bit the pessimistic bit, but so can you. So uh, uh, I thought I'd emphasize the optimistic rather than the uh, pessimistic. Um, in Marrakesh, there was a very powerful feeling of getting on with the job, uh, that uh, this is a remarkable agreement, um, this is delivery time, how are we actually going to do it? And countries coming up with their own ideas, their longer term plans and so on. That was the mood. It was sort of um, a practical get on with it, not downhearted, uh, still very pleased that it come into force just on November the 4th at the beginning of the, essentially at the beginning of the Marrakesh uh, conference. Others will take their own moods. Um, let me, I'm not going to say much about Brexit, others can pick that uh, <coughs> up. It does seem to me that we will have differences with our partners in the EU on all sorts of things, it's very important to find areas where we agree with each other and want to work together. And I'm sure with the skills of Pete and uh, his colleagues and others that we'll find, uh, we'll find a way, I hope, because of the enormous importance of the subject but also its importance in uh, EU countries working together and working together with the UK, that uh, climate could and should be one of those areas where we get on with it together, notwithstanding whether or not the UK is, uh, or notwithstanding when, I should say, uh, and on what terms the UK leaves the, uh, leaves the EU. And let me finish with one conversation with the Environment Minister of Ontario, talking, of course, about the USA and the election. He drew our attention to the fact that under uh, Stephen Harper, who was Prime Minister for about 10 years before Justin uh, Trudeau, who took Canada out of Kyoto, put in more subsidies for fossil fuels, 10 years of that, uh, British Columbia, Ontario, Quebec, other parts just got on with it. Uh, and his view was that they actually accelerated because of what was going on in the federal uh, capital. Now, don't get carried away, <laughs> but uh, don't, uh, don't see it all as uh, uh, impossibly difficult. Now, um, that was my 10 minutes. The, uh, we now have Pete Betts, Jennifer Morgan, Emmanuel Guerin, Alina Avachenkova. Um, I don't want to spend much time on introduction, but we have some, on this platform, we have some real heroes of the last <coughs> year or two. Uh, Pete um, uh, led for the EU as well as the UK in the negotiations. The UK drove along with others, of course, the high ambition group. Pete was absolutely core to that in the House of Parliament, including the House of Lords. They, people were competing each other to rise up and praise uh, Pete Betts and uh, Amber Rudd for the outcome. So, with Pete, we're enormously grateful to you for that. I'll embarrass the others uh, as we move on, but Pete, now you, you, you were and are a hero on all this, and it's uh, very, good to, very good to have you with us. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, I'm slightly humbled by that introduction. And, um, uh, so I've been asked to address um, three, three questions, which I'll do uh, fairly, fairly quickly. So what were the headline outcomes of COP22? Did COP22 meet billing as a COP of action and implications of Brexit? So on the first, I think the headline outcomes of uh, COP22 were pretty modest. And the reason for that is clear. It's essentially because of the way that Paris was set up. So, you know, we're basically on a sort of five-year cycle. So the next big moment is going to be, next big political moment is going to be in 2018 when we have the first facilitative dialogue, which is effectively the stock take uh, which we'll have every five years where we look at, you know, where we are as a world, how we're doing, are we doing, how far off track are we towards two degrees or one and a half degrees. 
So we have that moment in 2018, and then we have the moment in 2019 and 20 when everybody needs to revisit their NDCs and come forward with a number for 2030. So that's kind of the political negotiation cycle we're on. Um, we did get a big uh, rule book to be developed uh, in Paris, but because of the negotiation dynamic where, you know, this slightly tiresome mantra that we, the negotiators always follow, which is that nothing's agreed till everything's agreed, it was always clear that you were going to agree the rules package in, tw in 2018 or 2019 rather than in Marrakesh. So, you know, we did a, quite a lot of work uh, uh, prior to Marrakesh to, you know, communicate that and manage expectations around that. Um, having said that, um, I think the, you know, Mar Marrakesh did everything it needed to do. Uh, we, we, we had the first meeting of the CMA, which is the formal, the, the COP meeting formally as the decision-making uh, body of, for Paris. Um, we agreed immediately to adjourn that because um, uh, unless we did, uh, we need to do that in order to, because if, you, if you're not, if you haven't ratified yet, then you're not a party and we want everybody to have a, uh, um, to have a seat at the table in defining the rules. So we basically set up a process where the next two, couple of years, everybody will have a say in the rules uh, and then they'll be adopted, we hope, as a package in 2018, and that, that deadline has been set. Uh, so that was, that was really the big, the big thing. Um, uh, we also had the, the roadmap, this, so developed countries committed back in Copenhagen and Cancun to mobilize $100 billion a year by 2020, and developed countries uh, set out um, uh, a report on how we were doing on that. That was led by UK and Australia. Nick Hurd played a very leading role there. I think that was, as you know, this is always a slightly adversarial context, but I think that was received as, in, in as as well in a way that was as good as could have been expected. Uh, developed countries agreed to continue scaling up uh, finance and a work program reviewing. It was agreed. Uh, there's a presidencies will take. We'll do consultations on the facilitative dialogue. It was agreed the adaptation fund will serve the Paris Agreement. So there's a number of kind of detailed technical uh, provisions which are important to many parties which were agreed. I think the other thing to remember is you, you always get these press stories, oh, you know, they all assembled and all they got was, was a deadline for the negotiations in 2018. Actually, you know, the way these negotiations work is you don't, you don't kind of, if you've got a three-year work plan to agree a set of rules. You don't agree a third the first year, a third the second year, and a third the third year. You, you agree the whole thing in a package. But that doesn't mean you don't do anything in the, in the meantime. You, you, you know, there's a whole host of fora and in, informal conversations that happen where you understand better where countries are coming from, you narrow differences, and you move towards convergence. That's how we did it in Paris. That's how we'll do it for 2018. So there was a lot of that conversation happening in the margins, sort of clarifying. Uh, where we uh, sort of potential landing grounds. Second question: Did it agree? Did it meet its billing as COP of action? I mean, it's it's very difficult in a in a kind of negotiating context of a COP, a single you know international meeting, to capture action. That's one of the problems. But actually, you know, we have got whatever it is, 191 NDCs. They're fairly variable in their quality and rigor, but they are you know by and large, there's a huge amount happening in the real world to deliver on these NDCs. It's really, as you were saying, Nick, really striking. Uh, so I think, you know, it, there's always an issue about how do you bring that, how do you, how do you bring that, make that visible in a, in a negotiation context? Uh, and there was a lot of, you know, presentations and sessions where pe people uh, talked about what they were doing. Uh, there was a huge amount of activity by businesses. I mean, I just mentioned Walmart, which is the you know, largest company in the world by revenue. Uh, that agree, they agreed to reduce their emissions by 15% by 2030 on a 2015 baseline. That's pretty impressive. I think, I, I can't remember, there was some factoid that they take something like 16% of Chinese exports or mm -hmm. something, you know, some, some astronomical figure like that, just that company. We've got 471 companies representing over $8 trillion in market capitaliza capitalization who've undertaken commitments on climate change. So, you know, this stuff that companies are doing is really big and real. And as Nick was saying, this all comes on the back of really a pretty successful year with the agreement on ICAO, on aviation emissions, agreement on in under Montreal on HFC emissions. So, as Nick referred to, I guess you know the big the big um, the big thing that that happened was the U.S. election, um, and you know that could have had put quite a damper on proceedings. I don't think it did. Um, 
I think Nikki's absolutely right. We don't know what the new administration is going to do yet. They're clearly, Mr. Trump is clearly in the process of forming his administration, of deciding on these policies. I think there's still a lot of, a lot we don't know. We shouldn't leap to conclusions. And certainly there's some, been some interesting signals uh, in the last few days. Um, but I thought it was striking how just about every major economy uh, affir reaffirmed their commitment to deliver their NDC. China and India in particular were very clear that nothing had changed in that respect. They were going to deliver their NDC. Uh, and also, you know, real affirmation of commitment to the Paris regime. You know, the rule set and the five-year review cycle. It was a clear commitment to that. And in a way, this kind of – it's a slightly more bottom-up regime than Kyoto. It's not an entirely bottom-up regime. It's a hybrid. But in a way, that, that's more resilient uh, than, um, than maybe than other regimes might have been in the past. So, you know, I, I thought that was really encouraging. We had countries ratifying in, during uh, Paris uh, – okay. uh, sorry, Marrakesh, in, including the UK, might be said. Uh, uh, you know, so I, I, I think there was a clear sense that, um, that the thing is, is clearly on track. Thirdly, um, uh, Brexit. Um, so UK has voted to leave the EU. Uh, I think it's too early to say exactly what the implications of Brexit are for how precisely the UK will engage on international climate change in the longer term. Uh, for now, we remain a, a member state of the EU with all the rights and responsibilities of a member state, including in international negotiations as well as in negotiating domestic uh, uh, internal EU legislation, in particular on, on emissions trading scheme and the effort share regulation. Um, I, I think it's, you know, we've had pretty clear <coughs> signals um, that the UK's commitment to high ambition on climate is undimmed. So, you know, the, the, almost the last act of Mr Cameron's government was to accept the Climate Change Committee's recommendation to 57% reduction by, for the fifth carbon budget. That's the years 2028-2032. I think that's probably the most ambitious of any major economy in the world. And almost the, one of the first acts of the new May government, what Mrs May government, was to legislate uh, that reduction. Um, so, you know, that is a you know, really uh, ambitious uh, uh, target. Uh, we also have our commitment to spend 0.7% of GDP, or GNI, on o official development assistance written into legislation. So no other country has that, uh, and no other major economy is achieving anything like 0.7% of GNI on ODA. So, you know, how, we in, how, cl how climate will be affected by Brexit, um, um, you know, as the negotiations proceed, and as it, as it concludes, it's, it's too early to say. There's clearly um, issues to resolve, like, you know, what is, the f what is our future relationship with ETS and the effort share regulation? What is our future relationship to the EU's international NDC, to its, to, to its national determined contribution? Questions around how we negotiate in the in the UNFCCC. Um, we don't know what those will be yet, but I would say, and I think you made this point too, Nick. I think that you know we are very aligned around you know with with the EU and mm -hmm. you know, EU member states on ambition. We've worked really closely with you know key member states, you know, France, Germany, the Commission and others on things like the High Ambition Coalition and Cartagena. Um, so I think there is an awful lot of alignment and an awful lot of, you know, very deep um, uh, relationships uh, there uh, that will, you know, mean that we will, um, that will help us to, you know, work, collaborate together uh, uh, as with others um, um, as we and as we clarify the, uh, the long-term arrangements. Thank you, Pete. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Jennifer, are, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Very good. So uh, I've been now going to, I think that was my 11th COP. I've been going to all of them since 2006. And what I invariably do if I'm trying to understand what's going on is I find Jennifer. <laughs> uh, because her understanding of the way in which the international community interacts with each other, what really matters uh, what's going on is quite remarkable and that's because she's very good at steering what goes on and to be very good at steering what's going on you've got to understand what's going on. Um, 
she, you, I think you've got the biographies, so I'm not going to go through them in, in great detail, but um, Jennifer was the global director of the climate program at the World Resources Institute, and she's now executive director at uh, Green, Greenpeace. Um, she is from the United States and understands United States uh, politics and economics on this subject extremely well, but she is very much, and I think we are still allowed to use this term, a citizen of the world, <laughs> and um, uh, is uh, and has a home um, in Germany as well, and is very deeply involved in um, European uh, decisions and all that, and of course beyond the United States and uh, Europe. Um, Jennifer has been very important in the way in which these um, conferences and COPs have moved, you know, identifying difficulties, resolving difficulties, getting people together in a way that uh, can be done only by people outside government <coughs> sometimes and people who have some right to be seen as speaking for civil society as <coughs> Jennifer absolutely does. So Jennifer, thank you so much for all that you've done over the years. Thank you for um, informing me and guiding me and many others over those years. So you have the floor. Well, thank you very much. I also feel very humbled and uh, really pleased to at least be with you virtually. I wish I was there in person, but um, thank you for yeah allowing me to do it this way because I also am looking forward to hearing everyone and wish you all a happy Thanksgiving uh, <laughs> as well. It's a bittersweet Thanksgiving for many in the U.S. this year, but um, an important day to be thankful for what we've all been able to do over the years together on, on climate change. Um, so I was asked as well three questions. Um, one was just around COP22 and whether it was a COP of action. One was around what the U.S. election means for U.S. engagement with the UNFCCC, and then the third is around how easy will it be for a president-elect Trump to unravel the legislation and the, the role uh, and the things that Barack Obama played out. I think, um, you know, my, my first line actually is reflecting a little bit about what you said, Nick, at the beginning. And, and I think it also, you know, kind of going through what Pete said is, is one of the reasons why I, I think it was a fairly historic kind of a, an agreement, which is that it was true international cooperation across sectors. So governments, uh, NGOs, business, cities, states, um, all really came together. And so it was a very deep, a much deeper agreement, I think, than what we had had in the past. And by that, I mean linked in with national interests and focused on where you really needed to have international cooperation. And of course, at the highest level. So. That, I think, plays out or is in, even more important today than it was actually when Paris was finished and when it entered into force. I think as, um, as far as the COP of action, um, you know, Pete has walked through what happened in the negotiations, and I agree that that was, you know, kind of one of those COPs that's rather difficult to describe to the media, um, but there are the hooks there to get a good rule book moving forward. I think the thing that captured our attention most was that whereas in the past it was Greenpeace talking about 100% renewable energy, now it's actually corporations and countries who were committing to it. Uh, one of, I think, the highlights was when the Climate Vulnerable Forum, 48 countries, uh, on the last Friday committed themselves to go for 100% renewable energy and to increase um, their nationally determined contributions, and were actually joined in that meeting by China, Germany, and France. Um, and there, I think you can start to see, you know, hopefully UK can come in there as well. But um, that level of ambition on top of Paris, and I think that um, was indeed a, a really important development and also an important geopolitical development moving forward to watch um, that these countries have a voice. Lebanon and Colombia joined at the last minute, which are not mm. unimportant countries to either. And then we did also have a number of <coughs> companies mentioned. Um, some of their commitments, but there's 83 big influential companies who've adopted a 100% renewable energy target and power, and my understanding is an Indian cement company, Dalmia Cement, actually announced their commitment to 100% renewables by the COP. So I think that was important, the long-term 
strategies that came forward, I think, is is a good is an important part of action. Obviously, um, action can't be put off until the long term. But if you don't know where you need to go, you might not make the right choices. I think the German State Secretary talked about if you're thinking about transport only out to 2030, you, you'll do something different than if you're thinking about completely decarbonizing it and moving into a very different kind of a disruptive model um, out to 2050. So you had a, uh, which uh, Emmanuel, you may, may speak about this as well, but I thought this was part of the action too, of really a way to avoid carbon lock-in by having these long-term plans. The Germany had put something forward the week before with key sectoral targets. Francois Hollande announced a climate neutral uh, uh, target. Countries moving forward, I think there's 22 countries, 15 cities, etc. So um, that was that was important. And the last piece, which links into um, kind of this question about the U.S. election, which I thought was um, more important. I mean, I think the fact that, um, you know, Marrakesh was going to kind of be a sleeper conference in a way. It was like, well, how many times can we celebrate that it's entered into force so quickly? And how often can we talk about it? But because of the results of the U.S. election, it became a much more important meeting. Because if you think about it, if, if Marrakesh hadn't been going on, there may have been some statements by some mm. leaders and countries about moving forward, moving ahead with or without you know, the United States. But the fact that they were there together, the fact that um, you, know, you had the media there, it was the only thing they wrote about for quite some time. Um, and you had you know, the Chinese moving forward that saying it's not gonna affect their commitment um, moving forward in other countries. Uh, have been mentioned, I think, um, was very important in the proclamation that came out of, it took on an additional symbolic um, meaning. We actually, at Greenpeace, we um, organized, you may have seen in the pictures around the world, the hashtag, we're moving ahead. That was uh, something that we helped or drove to make happen. And the thing that I found striking about that was that it was the biggest family photo for UNFCCC, but it, it I think it tried to capture that depth of the commitment that um, is there as far as moving forward. So, you know, we now know that President-elect Trump has said he has an open mind to Paris. We know that leaders engaged with him uh, as well. During the COP, you had 365 companies or more uh, weigh in with the president-elect telling them they want to stay in. There's money to be made. There's innovation. Mm -hmm. There's national interest there, and of course, you know, cities and public. So I heard sometimes these comparisons between when Bush pulled out the U.S. out of Kyoto versus now, but I, I actually think it's just a fundamentally different moment in history for the reasons that have been spoken, but deeper domestic action um, and uh, much deeper, I think, um, commitment and intent internationally. Of course, I think, you know, if you ask what it means, um, I think that there are... Um, implications um, for it. I think obviously if you look at who is currently on the list, we don't know who will come into the cabinet at the end of the day on some of the key posts around climate change, but you, um, according to what the Trump has been saying during his election campaign, you can imagine that it would be very difficult for multilateral fora or, mul or plurilateral like the G20 to be a driving force or to be moving things forward um, in any way. And I think it really puts, um, and you already heard that during the COP um, countries, you know, the European Union was a bit in the spotlight. The German minister was out there huh. uh, putting things forward. But I think one key dynamic to be watching, which is a bit like deja vu all over again, but I think is much deeper, is that type of bilateral <laughs> cooperation or in Europe, Optima Europe as a whole, but even groups of member states that um, are implementing renewable energy policy, uh, that have an energy transformation that we have in Germany, taking that opportunity um, to move forward um, and taking that market that we know is opening up or is there uh, and stepping into that. So um, at the same time, you know, I'm an optimist uh, as well as this, but um, if you look at the, the statements of what this could look like domestically in the U.S. Um, and obviously the role that that would have uh, internationally, because I think one reason why 
um, you know, was different this time is that you actually had a national plan and an action plan in place uh, in the United States, which then allowed the administration to be able to be engaging others in a different way than in the past, and nobody could hide behind them completely anymore. But clearly, there's a very apocalyptic scenario domestically, and um, and there's one that's not so bad, and we really just don't know if we're honest about it. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, if Myron Ebel becomes uh, EPA administrator, then of course it's a very different story uh, than if somebody else does. And similarly, in the Department of Energy and the Secretary of State, and you know we're all watching and reading what 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 is being done there. But I I think that we are in a very different situation than we've ever been in before. Um, so one option, of course, if you look at I mean um, the clean the whole climate action plan is based on executive authority, Clean Air Act, et cetera. Um, you know, I think there's been very clear statements by the president-elect that he wants to bring back coal, that he wants to overturn all of these things. It's not as easy as the Senate can block um, that, and I think it will be a central fight. Uh, um, but I think the Clean Power Plan and what happens in the Supreme Court um, you know, one fundamental plank of that. that um, another is the fuel economy standard that are up in 2018 for a review. We know the day after the election, and they're trying to uh, roll those back, but there you see California you're playing a disrupt much further. <laughs> Jennifer, can you can you hear me? Hello. It's her end. Okay. Um, well, it, let's hope that Jennifer comes back so that we can thank her and uh, and if she could um, close off. But we certainly heard very thoughtful and uh, indeed also sobering uh, intervention. So thank you. I don't know if you can hear me, Jennifer, but whether or not, thank you very much and hope you can come back in in a minute. Let's uh, move on to Emmanuel Guerin. And um, Emmanuel is currently with the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, which is uh, the second largest philanthropy on energy and climate change. But uh, what I wanted to emphasize today is uh, Emmanuel's work in the year or two before Paris and at Paris. Um, uh, some of us were very close to what was going on. And somebody has to actually do the text and distill the text and persuade people to do X or Y. And it doesn't just happen on the week or two before December the 12th. It was a long, long story of um, Laurence Tubiana, Emmanuel, particularly persuading, talking to countries from Saudi Arabia to China to the United States and so on. Um, it didn't sort of distill out of the ether at 8.30 on uh, p.m. on December the 12th. And that work was absolutely remarkable. I mean, I've, I've named their three very different countries. To get them, as it were, on the same page, aligned, ready to move, was quite remarkable. I mean, he's young and strong, but I have to say he was one of the tiredest people I have ever seen that uh, that night, and for the very best of reasons. Um, there was an enormous load carried on those uh, young shoulders, and Emmanuel, we all owe you uh, a tremendous debt, and it's very nice that uh, we've got a little gathering today where we can express it. Um, but we also uh, would like to hear from you. Thank you very much, um, Nick. Uh, thank you for uh, the invitation. Thank you for uh, the um, in, um, the um, introduction, and, and most importantly, um, thank you for um, the friendship and, and uh, the inspiration um, all these years and, and on the run up um, to Paris. So um, let me let me share with you a few thoughts um, on COP twenty two, Trump, uh, Brexit, and and try to draw. Um, lessons for uh, the next uh, steps of climate action um, and, and trying not to repeat what's um, already been said by, by Pete and by Jennifer. So first on the, um, the outcome of uh, 
COP22. Um, I think if um, um, COP22 was um, successful in the end, um, it's not just, as um, uh, Pete said, uh, because of the final um, outcome, uh, the text of the declaration itself and, and everything around it, but as um, as Jennifer emphasized, uh, because of all the, um, the press conferences and the press communique um, that were um, issued just after uh, the election um, of Trump in the um, in the U.S. Uh, because I think I think it was extremely important that the uh, the general public and not just uh, the climate community gathered um, in in Marrakesh hears um, a a very very strong and and very broadly shared uh, message that um, whether or not the uh, U.S. withdraws from the uh, the Paris Agreement. Um, well, first, the Paris Agreement is not dead, um, and, and second, um, climate action um, is going to continue. And the fact that we've heard very clearly and very strongly uh, this message uh, sent by China, India, France, the UK, Germany, Canada, and many other um, countries with, I think, the most important um, outcome of the COP um, in Marrakesh. Um, that being said, of course, we've got to be um, honest with um, the implications um, of uh, uh, Trump's election um, and, and there is no room for business as usual because I mean the implications are very important. Um, in, in many ways um, this is the first real test of success and strength for the Paris Agreement um, I would argue um, and, and sure um, it is it is unfortunate that this test um, comes so early um, in the life of the Paris Agreement. It is very unfortunate that it takes uh, this form, but nonetheless, this is a test for uh, the strengths and the efficiency of the Paris Agreement. And, and like others um, before me, um, without being naive, um, I'm, I'm pretty hopeful uh, that the Paris Agreement um, is in fact pretty pretty strong and pretty resilient uh, precisely because of the way it was um, negotiated and, and designed and, and it will have to be implemented. Um, first, because I mean it puts first and foremost the notion of um, national interest into, into this international agreement through the concept of nationally determined contributions, but I think it's extremely important that this is the notion uh, that comes first um, in this agreement. Uh, but also second because, of, well, it is the result of a broad and shared leadership and not just leadership by one country or two, uh, the U.S. and China, uh, but m many more countries as part of the High Ambition Coalition or, or the Climate Vulnerability uh, Forum, but also as um, Jennifer um, emphasized, uh, the result of the um, mobilization of uh, the businesses, uh, the investors, um, the cities, the regions and states. And, and um, we've seen, um, again, with the election of Trump, um, the um, importance um, of the mobilization in particular uh, by um, the U.S. Um, businesses. Uh, on, on Trump, more specifically, I mean, of course, that came as a huge um, shock for many of us, if not all of us in, in, in this room, but, but um, we also have an obligation, I think, to recover uh, very quickly uh, from uh, this shock. Um, that being said, I think, so we need, we need a, a quick response, and I'll come back to it um, in a minute, but I think we also need to take the time for reflection and understanding of what happened. Um, and, and, I mean, we need to do both at the same time, for sure. Um, there is no time for complacency, uh, but I think it's it's also very important to try and understand deeply and profoundly what happened um, and and um, what is the message that was expressed uh, by those who voted for um, Trump and for Brexit before that. It's, it's, by the way, two different things to try and understand what Donald Trump means um, and it changes from one day to the other, uh, but trying to understand I would argue not just the frustrations, but also the aspirations um, of those who uh, voted for him um, is, um, is extremely important if we want to uh, uh, design a strategy um, uh, that responds to um, uh, this, um, this threat. Um, at, at a very high level, um, I'd say that we need two things. Um, one, uh, we need to put an even stronger emphasis um, on some of the national um, and local benefits um, of climate action. 
um, energy security, uh, job creation, um, innovation, um, um, reduction of local air pollution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, all of it is part of the DNA of the Paris Agreement, but but we need to put an even stronger emphasis um, I need on these uh, things. Uh, but we also need, and, and let's be frank, we'll need a renewed um, international um, leadership because, I mean, Paris is also uh, the result of leveraging the national international dynamics, and it's not just uh, by going stronger on implementation at the national level uh, that we're going to succeed. So um, we'll need to find a way of filling the vacuum um, of um, uh, the loss of um, U.S. leadership, um, of course, um, China is going to have to play a role, um, and, and I'm fairly confident that China will play um, a leadership role, uh, both at the national level and at the international level. Uh, but of course, um, China is not going to be capable of doing it alone, so it, 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 it's, it's a leadership that will have to be nurtured and supported. Um, of course, also by uh, the European Union, um, I mean, I think we're not, we're not putting enough emphasis on, on the leadership role that um, Europe has to play um, with the result of the um, uh, US election. I mean, Europe in uh, tandem with uh, the UK for uh, the reasons uh, that were um, um, explained before. Um, I'd argue that Germany in particular has, has um, an especially important role to play, uh, both because this is climate, but, but also because of the special relationship with, um, with China. Um, let me let me conclude with with a few lessons, um, at least at this stage from from Brexit and 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 Trump's election. Um, I think I think one very important lesson is that as as a community and also as an academic community, since we're gathered here at the LSE, uh, we need to pay much more attention to. Um, issues related to the just transition. I mean, all the all the social um, issues related to the transition to a low carbon economy, low carbon society. More um, generally, I think I think there is room for self criticism, or at least for self reflection. Um, I think I think overall, and of course there are very important exceptions, but I think overall, um, as a climate movement, we've had a tendency to insist on the fact that. What was really important was the transition to a low-carbon and climate-resilient economy, um, and that, well, if it happened in a just and fair way, uh, that would be some kind of a bonus, uh, but um, that was not uh, um, at the center um, of the um, academic argument or the political uh, discourse. I think what we're uh, discovering, um, of course, that shouldn't be a discovery through the result of these elections, is that it's not, it shouldn't be just an afterthought um, and a bonus. I mean, it is the absolutely uh, in fundamental enabling condition to the success of, of, of this um, um, transition. Um, I also think that um, both as an academic community and, and um, as a political community, we've got a tendency to think that this is mainly an issue about finance and making sure uh, we find ways of compensating the losers um, of this particular way of globalization or technical change. Um, I think there is more than just um, economics and finance in, 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 in this discussion. I mean, it is fundamentally about pride and identity, and, and these people fundamentally feel um, left out and, and disenfranchised, and that they're no longer a part of the political discourse and building uh, the progressist um, political project. So this is, this is absolutely a project that needs to be designed with these people and not for these people, which is always a bit condescending um, um, otherwise. Um, and I think, I think this has very practical implications we need to grapple with because I think on the run-up to Paris, we've, we've built an infrastructure to tap into the power um, of the globalized um, elite with, with C40, with, with women business, et cetera, et cetera. But I think we need to build the infrastructure to connect much more strongly and, and effectively uh, with local politics, um, with grassroots movements, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it's, it's, it's a really exciting um, um, challenge um, in front of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. And, and let's see if we can pick up some of the issues and challenges you quite rightly raise in, in the discussion. Um, before I pass over to Alina, um, Jennifer, can you hear us at the moment? I can. Sorry, I've moved back out, but I can hear you. 
we we just lost you, Jennifer, when you uh, were talking about the criticality of the appointments in um, EPA Energy State. Uh, you were talking about the um, energy standards coming up in 2018, uh, what the Senate can do and what it can't. I think it was just around that time that we we lost you. I, I, is there anything you'd like to add on, on the end of that? <coughs> Thanks. The, actually, the points that Emmanuel was just making at the end were the points that I wanted to end with as well, because I think the movements that are uh, now, in a way, catalyzed uh, in the United States across social, health, children, environment, etc., I think are the movements and the set of values that we need to be supporting um, the royal we, all of us, um, around the world. And I think we're thinking a lot about what that means for action on climate, but also action on peace and, and other issues. And so I would just want to uh, give extra, you know, emphasis to what Emmanuel just said. I think it's fundamental that we learn, that we listen, and that we actually connect um, in a different way. And, and um, if there was ever a message that came for, for me, uh, that was one of, one of them. So I think it's an opportunity for unity of movements across the world for this agenda, which is, goes beyond climate. Thank you, Jennifer. We'll, uh, after Alina's um, intervention, we'll, we'll have 20, 25 minutes, and let's see if we can focus our attention on uh, <laughs> on those issues. But first, we have Alina Avachenkova. Uh, Alina is um, at the heart of the Grantham Research Institute work on uh, policy. Uh, she has deep, deep experience, including with the UNFCCC, private sector, and uh, and so on and done many big, widely recognized things at uh, Grantham. Let me just mention two. One is the long-standing and very influential tracking of legislation in countries around the world. It's, it, it's unique and it's important and it's very carefully um, uh, followed and there's great attention to it, quite rightly so. And secondly, the launch uh, this year, and it was a very well attended, very good event um, th around the study that uh, they've done on the credibility of the nationally determined contributions. It's, um, it's very impressive if you look at what everybody's doing and do you rank, uh, suddenly they focus, <laughs> and uh, particularly those who haven't been ranked very high. Um, and uh, it's something that needed to be done, but also something that uh, was quite rightly uh, uh, a very strong uh, focus of attention. So thank you very much for that, uh, Alina. The, the floor is yours. I think it just works. Uh, does it? Oh, okay. Good <laughs> afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you, Nick, for this uh, introduction. Um, I, what I will do, I was asked as well to address the same question as the previous speakers first, was the COP a COP of action in my view? And then I will go to talk about where are we in terms of implementation um, a year after Paris <coughs> based on some of the recent studies that we have done here at the Grantham Research Institute. Um, so going into the scope, I think um, as, as previous speakers have pointed out, the expectation was that it will be a low key one. However, having spent some years at UNFCCC Secretariat, for me, there was a huge risk uh, going into Marrakesh, and that risk was that um, in the past, every COP that has reached uh, a major breakthrough in terms of adopting the Kyoto Protocol, adopting the Bali Action Plan, has seen a, the next meeting was a bit of a downturn, and uh, there was a then going into the details of what did we actually mean by the words in the agreement and a bit of a backtracking and a back push. Um, and my personal worry, well basically my criteria for success of Marrakesh were three things. No reopening of what was agreed in Paris and, and major backtracking uh, from that. Secondly, a clear deadline and um, uh, willingness to progress on the rule book. And finally, some evidence of progress on the ground in terms of implementation of uh, some of the promises made in Paris. And uh, to me, I think on, on the first two points, previous speakers have already spoken to that. 
but um, it was, I think, really a signal of a wave change in the international negotiations that we really didn't see a lot of a pushback in terms of reopening um, the political agreement in Paris. And, and, and to me, from my experience, that is for the first time um, since, uh, since a COP that has had a major success. I think that's very important. I think uh, Pete and others have already addressed the rule book. It's very important that the deadline is set for 2018. So let me focus on the last point, which is the progress in terms of implementation and on delivering um, on Paris. Um, <coughs> Well, I've spent quite a bit of my time in Marrakesh uh, engaging with the legislators community and uh, some of the work we've done at the Institute actually is targeting legislators and providing tools for them to, to go and implement the agreement back at home. And what was interesting, the Interparliamentary Union together with the Parliament of Morocco as uh, in the previous COPs decided to hold a parliamentary summit in Marrakesh. And talking before that, we thought, well, you know, it's not a major COP, it's not Paris, we're probably not going to get a huge attendance. What was remarkable, 250 legislators from all around the world registered and actually came to Marrakesh. I, I was privileged to address the meeting and it was, it was really interesting to see that uh, that interest and the political attention that was generated did not end in Paris. The legislators came. But they now came with the question in mind, actually, how, how do we do it? And that's what a lot of the debate in that parliamentary meeting was about, exchanging experiences, how do you actually push for uh, climate um, legislation to be passed and then to be implemented. And at our own side event, hosted by Grantham Research Institute uh, last Thursday, we had a very interesting, remarkable intervention from a senator from Kenya who was actually behind um, development and uh, passage of the uh, Kenya's Climate Change Act earlier this year. And he shared, I thought it was very valuable, first-hand information, which actually touches on some of the points Emmanuel raised. Uh, he basically talked about how Kenya engaged grassroots, um, going from village to village, from city to city, to build support for climate change action and for passing the legislation, which then actually helped to overcome some of the opposition and some of the ministries. So I think um, the conversation really shifted and demonstrates that there is, um, there is now attention to implementation. Now let me talk about some of the challenges um, because uh, it's not all rosy and uh, we have done a study that Nick has mentioned going into Marrakesh. We wanted to see, you know, for G20 countries which are responsible for over 80% of greenhouse gas emissions globally, <coughs> if we look at what they have committed to in Paris and where they are now in terms of domestic uh, policy frameworks and legislation, how consistent are those frameworks with the targets that were promised in the NDCs? Where is additional action required? Um, and um, uh, basically came up with recommendations for the G20 countries. The second criteria we looked at was how are countries performing in terms of delivering on their 2020 pledges? Because uh, if, if countries are behind on those, it will be quite hard to um, to then be successful on the 2030 action, which is embedded in the NDCs. And the third indicator we considered in terms of uh, consistency with the Paris Agreement is the ramping up of ambition, which is one of the key requirements that each subsequent NDC has to be more ambitious than the previous <coughs> one. Obviously, one year from Paris, it's too early to assess where the countries are raising their ambition levels. They have not been required to do so yet. But we have looked historically at what G20 countries have been doing since Kyoto and to see whether they're, um, the pattern of climate change commitments they've been putting on the table actually uh, exhibits kind of increasing level of ambition. Um, the, um, the publication is outside on the tables and it's also available on the website. Um, I also want to recognize my call for Senior Mati Kainer who um, has been um, crucial in putting this together. But um, basically what we see is that out of all G20 countries, only four jurisdictions, including EU, UK, Germany, um, and France can be considered to, be, to have national frameworks and past behavior in 2020. 
um, implementation consistent with the requirements of the Paris Agreement. Um, and even then, uh, each of these jurisdictions faces uh, its own internal challenges in terms of implementation. Um, the EU still has to finalize its effort sharing agreement and effectively delivery on the commitment will depend on how member states actually implement it. But nevertheless, these are four jurisdictions responsible for 10% of global emissions which could be considered as being um, roughly on track. Half of G20 countries are behind on their 2020 pledges, uh, which is quite worrying, and among those are four large um, industrialized countries, um, including US, Canada, Australia, and Mexico. And the case of Mexico is, is the one that is, um, uh, Mexico has been very ambitious in, um, in pushing for, um, uh, for climate change action. They have committed to quite an ambitious targets and the fact that they're struggling with delivering on 2020 signals that there is still quite a lot that needs to be done in terms of building national capacity, which will be um, the case for a lot of other countries, in particular developing countries as well. Um, so basically, we have um, um, identified several groups of countries which um, need to um, make adjustments to their domestic legislative and national frameworks in terms of uh, either adjusting the level of domestic targets to bring them <coughs> in line with what was committed um, in the NDCs. But we also have a group of countries, including US, Canada, Australia, where NDC essentially establishes an economy-wide emission reduction, where at the moment these countries don't have an economy-wide framework. So they, they will face a greater issue in terms of delivering on NDC and um, making uh, greater adjustments to their national uh, policy frameworks going forward. Um, I should also note that in our analysis we did not look at the level of ambition being sufficient for two degrees and uh, it's quite well known according to Carbon Tracker, actually all G20 countries need to step up their ambition to be online with two degrees. So what does it show us? It actually tells us that yes, there is still quite a lot of challenges ahead and um, most uh, G20 countries will need to take further actions at the national level to bring their domestic targets in line with NDCs. On the promising side though, I think uh, previous speakers mentioned uh, four of these large emitters in Marrakesh put on the table long-term um, low emission development strategies. That includes US, Canada, Mexico, and Germany. Um, so that is certainly a welcome move. But um, I think um, as, w as, as other speakers noted as well, what is now really needed is um, um, a careful review of national actions and policies in each of the countries, review of legislation and um, adjustment of those to make sure that countries can deliver on Paris. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Elena. Well, we've heard that Marrakesh was um, workmanlike, getting on with the job, um, in, and I won't rehearse the details that lie behind that description and that it was of particular significance in getting on with the job um, in the light, of course, of the, uh, uh, the results of the US election on November the 8th. Um, but I hope that we can have um, a discussion now. I mean, there, w there will be questions, and, uh, but I'd like to ha structure the discussion a bit to respond, really, to what we've heard and to use the um, the extraordinary skills and experience and insights of the people that we have with us. And I, I'd, we've got about 20 minutes, and I'd like, if with your permission, to focus on two, two questions. One is the international leadership mm -hmm. in the light of um, uh, Brexit and the US election, which were two clear subjects on the table for our agenda, but what could that international leadership look like? And secondly, um, how do we, uh, in a world where there are very serious questions raised about globalization and collaboration, <coughs> where there are very serious questions about the stake of people 
in the politics and economics of their countries. How do we, in that context, um, think about making the case, think about policies in ways that um, are clearly um, inclusive, that raise living standards in the short run and raise living standards in the longer run, and, uh, and give hope, I mean hope in the shorter run and hope in the uh, <coughs> in the medium in the medium term, I firmly believe that that can be done, and many of us have rehearsed arguments like that. But I think that our experience over these last uh, weeks and months surely tell us that um, we have to do it much better. We can't do it on our own. You can't just say, "Well, I've uh, finally understood what your problem is, and here's the answer to your problem." That's not the right way <laughs> to uh, to go forward. It's a question of constructing these ideas together. But uh, I'd first like to ask th the panelists um, if they'd like to make any observation on either of those two issues. Uh, Jennifer, have we got you? Yes. Yeah, so since we've got you, let's capitalize. Uh, could you? Would you like to start? Yeah, wh why don't you take, uh, yeah, why don't you, you do both, but try to do them quickly, if that's all right, Jennifer. I, I'm, a, I'm a bit nervous about losing you again. Yeah, no worries. I'll, I'll be quick on these. I mean, I think on your <laughs> first question, um, I think there are, if I look out into the horizon, I have to see different levels of this. I think I, I mentioned um, Emmanuel did as well and others. Um, the role of, of China here, and one of the things I wanted just to mention was, you know, those of us who have been watching China for many years, and whether the country is ready to, quote unquote, take on a leadership role um, in its history, which would be a real paradigm shift. I think that was occurring before Paris, and I think has moved more into the spotlight. Um, but you know, it needs to be a balanced leadership role. Um, that's clear for many reasons. So I would be, I think on the international leadership, uh, countries like China working together with, uh, I agree, Germany is, um, Germany is a, a key player here and I think needs to lean into its um, experience and its soft power more than it has in the past, having worked there mm. quite a lot. Uh, it has tremendous things to share with others. And then this group of climate vulnerable forum countries. I. You know, why not invite them to the G20? Um, why not integrate them much more uh, onto the political stage? Um, their emissions are that of Russia, if you put them all together. So I think that's a really interesting dynamic. And then the second piece I guess I would look at is the role of the quote unquote non-state actors in international leadership and the need to um, include in various ways which are consistent with international treaties um, the, the U.S. players that want to move forward. California was in Marrakesh, right? Representatives of California were in Marrakesh. They're hosting a major conference coming up. Governor Brown is deeply committed, sixth largest economy in the world. So we did this a bit before, but I think we have to be more deliberate about it. And um, hmm. whether it be on the social movement side or whether it be on the business side or the state, <coughs> I think that is a key place to look for international leadership and not forget the 75% of people who did not vote for um, a person who said he didn't understand that climate change was real. Um, your second question, I think, um, is one that is fundamental, and I think it depends on where we're where the starting point is. You know, I think from a great uh, from a Greenpeace or an NGO perspective, mm -hmm. a civil society perspective, I think it's a real. Uh, we need to be on the ground more. Uh, we need to be talking with people who. Uh, we haven't been talking to in the past and looking at what they need and what their concerns are and how to provide them with the, the you know whether it be the you know the electricity and getting the you know electrified at at very very cheap prices and fighting for those components in legislation whether it be just listening and engaging in what their priorities are and giving uh, i feel very much right now that we have to give that hope so that the, the feeling of being left alone in a globalized world is not channeled into 
um, a very negative place, but rather into a positive place. And so I think meeting them where they're at, um, civil society, working with them, and I think government, you know, to, pr to preserve the government institutions that we want to, that we need in a democracy or in other systems, then needs to pay more attention to these things, to these items, whether it be how you recycle revenue or all those things that we all know and talk about all the time have to, uh, we have to make sure that that has a voice and policy makers need to make sure to listen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jennifer. Um, now, I, I don't want to go to one rather than the other. Uh, are there observations um, from the panel? Because we ought to open up to questions, the, the panel that are here. Um, could you ought to open up to questions uh, fairly quickly? But um, Manuel, Alina, or Pete, is there anything you'd like to add? Not not compulsory. We can open up. But, uh, Emmanuel? Uh, yes, on, on international leadership um i think i think the good news is that there is there is there is no shortage of um climate leadership out there i think is is a point that we should emphasize because this is this is a very important point um because um paris was not just the result of um the g2 of of the us and china but also much more broadly of the high ambition coalition the climate vulnerable forum uh, the extraordinary um, leadership by businesses, cities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The, the the problem, both from a communication perspective and therefore from a political perspective, is is also that um, leadership needs to be personified into a limited number of people. Right? I mean, it's 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 both a strength and a weakness to have very shared um, leadership. Um, I don't think we need to be looking for the exact replacement of the bilateral leadership in between the US and China that would be that would be a mistake uh, but there needs to be something more or to complement the the shared leadership of of all these um entities and i absolutely think um that there is a role to be played by the european union together with the uk to reclaim in a way the the climate leadership that was lost um um, at some point, um, and I do think that that within this, uh, Germany has a very important role to play, and that the G20 under German presidency is a real test for um, the role of Germany in in the international system more more um, generally. On on the just transition thing, I think there there are two issues in front of us. One is because ob obviously this is a mo much broader issue than just climate. So the question is also how how do we in even intellectually connect the climate agenda to the much broader globalization, technical change, um, um, inequality agenda. I, and I don't think intellectually we've, we've completely cracked it yet. With I, I don't like the term co-benefit, to be frank. Um, at, at the same time, we, we shouldn't drop completely the fact that there are climate objectives, so it's not just about energy security or, or local air pollution, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, I think there is an intellectual agenda here. Then, then there is an organizational um, agenda, um, as, as I mentioned, because there, there are lots of people out there trying to do this, um, either the NGOs, and I think we, we, should, we should praise in particular the US NGOs for um, and the international NGOs for the extremely fast response to Trump's election, and they've already achieved some success, and they will need much more. But uh, so the NGOs are trying to do this. Some political parties are trying to do this. Um, some citizen platforms. Um, so the question is, how do we connect all these different initiatives um, and turn them into a force for um, political um, action? Thank you, Emmanuel. Pete. I'll be brief, Nick. Um, I guess I'm, I'm slightly less uh, less deniable than other other participants, being a bureaucrat. But um, but I'll offer some thoughts. So uh, this the question of leadership. So I do think that along with France, the U.S. probably provided more top level leadership than anyone else over the last few years, and it was really fantastic what U.S. together with France did. And clearly, you know, that we don't know what Mr. Trump's going to do, but the signs are that they won't be playing quite that role. But I think we need to think, what, what's the leadership for? Mm. You know, what is, the, what is the task? 
I think there's, there's an issue around, you know, what, we, what is it we need to agree multilaterally over the next few years? I do think uh, the natural leader there is the EU with, with, with the UK, and we're still in the, UK, in the EU, but uh, uh, I think that, you know, we, we have worked, we have been the ones that have convened the coalition with the vulnerables uh, over the years. I still think that's the core. Personally, I, I'd be interested to see it, but I doubt that China will play a proactive yeah. role in a multilateral context of leadership. I don't think they're, they're, they're there yet, but, you know, let's see. I would be happy to be proved wrong. Uh, on the other hand, I think, you know, the second area of leadership is what's going to happen in 2018, 19, 20? Is there going to be a collective raising of ambition? Um, clearly, you know, that may be more challenging, particularly we don't know what the U.S. is going to do, but if there are heightened perceived competitiveness pressures, mm -hmm. that's going to be much harder. So, you know, the role of China... Uh, along with the EU and others and UK and others is going to be absolutely key and you know how do we how do we you know address those perceived concerns um, I think there are there are also there's also scope for leadership around you know particular coalitions around issues so the UK has been working really closely with China on things like green finance and I think there's certainly scope yeah. for, for leadership there so I think I think we need to think about what's the leadership for and how do we how do we uh, generate the right the, the right leadership for those for the, for different for the particular issues concerned? Thank you very much, Pete. Alina. Um, I think um, I, I agree with what the speakers have said, and I think for me, in the vacuum of political leadership, what becomes really important is a practical one, if you can term it that way. Um, basically demonstrating in practice that um, low carbon transition really can happen, that those additional benefits can be delivered. And we have been seeing a lot of that actually being uh, one of the major drivers of the political success of Paris. And I think uh, with the U.S. elections, as I think Jennifer and others um, spoke before, this will be even even more important. So actually for, for the U.S. seeing the success of China in, in implementing some of that transition and benefiting for African countries, seeing their neighbors, Kenya, Ethiopia, delivering on both low carbon and climate resilient development creates uh, creates the willingness of leadership to actually um, go and do it um, ba back home as well. And I think one of the really important innovations of the Paris uh, infrastructure that we currently have is that we for the first time have created a space for those practical experiences to be formally kind of shared and brought together in, in a structured way every time that the COP meets. And, and in a sense, my hope is that this will uh, create that driver for the, some sort of a vacuum of political leadership we might see in some geographies at the moment. Thank you, Alina. Now, we, uh, we are short of time. Um, I'll just take three questions. If you could make them very short, and then um, we'll put them to the panel, and then we'll have to close. Okay, so there's a, a mic, so I, please, could you use? Uh, and could Chris you say your name, please? Yeah, Chris I'm, uh, I know what it is. But Chris Bowman, EBRD. Yeah. Um, question mainly for Pete, but perhaps the others. The link between international leadership and the NDCs. The direction of all this discussion has been that we're lost without EU leadership. We may lose Britain's role in that. We're back to France and Germany. Now, France and Germany have fairly good institutional structures. I am worried about the rest of the EU, and I'd ask, ask Pete in particular. If you have to leave Poland and Romania and Slovenia and Italy and Spain, do you need a stronger institutional structure like um, Climate Change Act, Committee on Climate Change, and so on? Do you need a stronger domestic structure in which civil society can intervene? Thank you, you mean you. within each member state? Or do yes, you mm. within each, each nationally determined member state. Th thank you, Chris. I'll, I'll take two other questions, even shorter, and um, then pass the panel. <coughs> Please. The LSE has a tradition of trying to achieve gender balance in questions, so <laughs> please bear that in mind. Yeah, Three Davey questions. LSE. It's a question for Alina about the direction of travel in Russia. What's happening and how's it looking in the future? So, name name again for everybody. Ed Davy from the ex LSE, now for the Prince of Wales. Yeah. Again, I know, but it for <laughs> the record, nobody else. Okay. And one more question, please.
thank you. I'm Prue Taylor from the University of Auckland, New Zealand. Um, and I'm really interested in this issue about um, bringing what you refer to as the climate vulnerable nations forward to participate more directly in leadership. And I'm thinking particularly of the SIDS in my part of the world, they're crucial countries. Um, and I'd just like some reflection on how this can be done. Um, you know, it's not just a matter of inviting them there and giving them the resource to be there. There are also cru uh, crucial cultural issues that need to be addressed as well. So I just thank you. Like some reflection on that. Thank you very much. Um, still with us, Jennifer? Yeah. And did you did you hear the question? Yes, I did. Very good. So, uh, in in the interest of time, because we're very short, um, could could you? Try the last one, but of course, feel free on the others. Yeah, I, um, on the last one, I, I totally take the point. It's more than um, just being invited to meetings, but that's, um, that's one thing that just brings recognition and gets heads of state together with other heads of state. I think also thinking about how they can participate in fora and how their voices are heard. I don't know if that's what you mean by cultural issues. Um, and the, the other is just to really um, think about them in the context of foreign policy, development policy, um, security policy as a whole, and not only on the climate side. And um, just my one line on Europe is, I actually think we're at a historic moment where Europe needs something new to be working on together. We have the iron, the coal and steel community why don't we make this the peace and security community around renewable energy and climate security? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Pete, a question from Chris to you on Europe. Yeah, thanks, Nick. So um, I, I keep hearing um, people say um, that the, the, the UK is not in the EU. The, U the UK is leaving the EU, but it hasn't left yet. And we still have yet to define uh, how we work with the EU once we've left. So we have um, a legislative package that is going to have to be adopted. Uh, that all being well will be passed by the end of next year. We will then have a burden share for the 40 percent. I think we'll then have a sense of, uh, you know, whether it's possible in a global context to offer any more. I think that will be a very difficult conversation. But I would imagine that others in the EU would want the UK to be part of that conversation. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, as regards how we, you know, how we would bring in any uh, bring in, um, you know, traditionally less ambitious member states, maybe a climate change act would, of some kind would help. But I, you know, I think it's I think it goes more to this just transition point. Uh, you know, there as elsewhere, we need to think about, you know, the perceived concerns of those countries and how we address them. Thank you, Pete. Uh, Alina, just because you have experience of being Russian doesn't mean you speak for <laughs> Russia, but <y> you, <laughs> any more than those of us with British passports, speak for the UK. But the, um, oh, you, you obviously know something. Uh, please. Well, uh, I'll, I'll try, and uh, that's a very fair point, Nick. I, I don't follow Russian policy very closely, but from um, from kind of being an outside observer more than anything at the moment, I should say, of course, um, the Russian NDC has been commented on as not being um, nearly ambitious, because uh, basically Russia doesn't need to do very much to to meet it at NDC in terms of additional policies. Yet, um, I personally was worried ahead of Paris in terms of how Russia might 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 behave in the negotiations, given the overall geopolitical situations and the relationship with the EU and and US. And I think the Russian delegation has been very constructive, and I think that's certainly a very positive sign. And the same can be said about Marrakesh. So I think that that gives uh, certainly a lot of optimism in terms of the domestic situation. Russia currently is in economic crisis. The exchange rate has changed quite significantly after the introduction of sanctions, and obviously the oil and gas price affects um, Russian overall um, income from exports. And, and, and in a sense, that gives an opportunity to reconsider kind of its, uh, its energy efficiency policy, its renewable energy policy, and, and the general kind of infrastructure investment. A lot of the arguments that Nick makes are very much 
uh, kind of in question for Russia. We have seen, we have heard some rhetoric from the current government that this is something on their mind in terms of the concrete policies. Uh, again, I might not be up to date, but so far um, th there is still a lot, a lot to be done. So that's my five cents to that. Thank you, Alina. Emmanuel, anything you'd like to add? Then I'll close v off. Very quickly on the um, vulnerables, um, I think there was um, already through the Climate Vulnerable Forum a, a very important cultural uh, change um, in these countries um, in the sense that um, for Paris, I mean, their strategy was no longer just to ask for other countries to do things because it would protect them, but, but they really decided, and they deserve big praise for that, um, I mean, they really decided to lead by example, uh, took very ambitious commitment for themselves, um, and, and um, up, well, they went really out of their comfort zone by doing this. Um, I, I really wish the international community doesn't forget that these people took very ambitious commitments, but, but for some of them need support to achieve these commitments, and not just for adaptation and resilience, but also access to sustainable energy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So really the bilateral development banks, the regional development banks, and the multilateral development banks, um, I think, have a duty to provide the, uh, the support to these countries that made Paris possible by uh, leading by example. Thank you very much. Let, I won't try and summarize. I mean, it's a, a been a very rich discussion from people who are deeply, deeply immersed in, uh, in, in the history and the substance. And we're very fortunate to have had um, Pete and Jennifer, Emmanuel, and Alina with us. Um, but let me just say one or two words at the end. And I, and I hope I'm reflecting the spirit of the discussion as well as my, uh, my own views. Um, I tried to frame it in the beginning as a global agenda with the Sustainable Development Goals and climate. And I think uh, in different ways, with different nuances, different emphases, that's run through this conversation. We have to see uh, development as a whole. We have to see it as sustainable and uh, inclusive. Um, you know, those are big words, and the SDGs are big targets, sustainable development goals. But we have to show very clearly, persuasively, through argument, but also very much through example, how this is all done uh, and how exciting it can be. Uh, so much of this is about community. You can't reuse and recycle other than in a community. You know, you don't have combined heat and power other than in a community. You don't have networks, be they public transport or other types of networks other than in a community. And those of us who've been involved as well as these grand global stages also with our local communities uh, realize just how cheerful and productive and constructive all this can be. And we have to, I think, set this out very clearly as being about sustainable and inclusive development, being about hope, being about living standards rising now, about employment and so on. Part of that is a just transition, but it's in a sense it's bigger than the just transition. It's integrating it all into a very powerful uh, development story. I, and it is a very powerful. It is the growth story in the shorter run with sustainable infrastructure boosting demand in the medium term where you unleash innovation, discovery, Schumpeterian period of growth. And it's the only growth story available in the long run because otherwise high, high carbon, any attempt at high carbon growth self-destructs. Uh, I think the sustainable infrastructure and as Emmanuel emphasized and Alina, the role of the uh, multilateral development banks is absolutely crucial. But the point is we have to do all this uh, whilst um, uh, recognizing that the next 20 years is absolutely critical. We will more than double our infrastructure in that time, roughly double the world economy. Get that extra world economy wrong. Get that extra more than doubling of infrastructure wrong, and you in two degrees is gone. Uh, it's tough now, but get those 20 years and indeed well below two degrees get that next 20 years wrong and uh, that chance is gone. So as we struggle with these issues, politically, analytically, economically, as we struggle with those issues, we also have to combine it with a sense of urgency and a sense of action and that's hard. But I don't think it's, uh, mm. I absolutely don't think it's impossible. And uh, finally a word on the leadership. I've worked in, in, in India for more than 
40 years and in China for nearly 30 now. They are both uh, ready to lead. Uh, Prime Minister Modi has said this is India's century. Uh, China has taken the lead in multilateral development banks increasingly, as we've heard and experienced in the discussion on climate change. I think both those countries, and they are, of course, the most important countries by people by a long way, uh, are critical. Neither of them would want to do it alone. They certainly wouldn't want to do it as a duo. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so um, the, that tells us very clearly and strongly that the role of the EU is going to be extremely important in a period where the United States may not be prominent in leadership. Uh, that trio, I think, is critical. I hope the UK would see itself as part of that. Um, but it has to be more. Mm. And how it's more, there has to be a major fourth or fifth block. I mean, the nature of things, you can't have too many leaders. But that extra block, I mean, Africa, Latin America, defined by vulnerability, you know, th there are various ways of thinking about it. And of course, leadership is self-selected. It's not for us sitting here at the LSE to say, right, you lot, you're the leaders. Uh, we send them an email and they say, yes, of course, I hadn't realized that. Um, it, leadership is, is self-motivated, self-selected. Uh, uh, but I think the call for it, we can all call for it. Mm. And that is something that we must, must do. Call for it and do it. So I, th I must say I found it a very rich discussion, enormously grateful to those who put it together. I'm never quite sure because it's such a good collective at the Grantham and at the um, Climate Change Centre, but I'm assuming that uh, Chris and Stuart and Ginny and Bob all had a lot to do with this. I'm sure there are others <laughs> as well. So thank you all for putting this together. But we've been privileged with a really distinguished group of panellists. Uh, I certainly know a lot to them over many years, uh, but certainly for today. So thank you all very much.